Welcome. You're listening to the Rutten River Pursuits Podcast. Join our epic pro staff around the sonic campfire for stories and adventures from our eastern mountains to the Chesapeake Salt. Let our highs and lows inspire you to take to the outdoors. Hey guys, this is Uncle Catfish, and you're sitting around the Sonic Campfire. This is Rutten River Pursuits. To my right, I have my brother, Kyle. I'm Ryan. Uncle Buck here. I'm Will. I'm Steve. I'm Dave. So tonight, I have a good friend of mine. And uh, let me tell you, three-time runner-up calling champion to me, I mean, that doesn't get any better than Travis Stout from He's GP Calls. the real deal, isn't he? Oh, my gosh. He is hilarious to sit with. He's got some of the best duck and goose stories in the business. And, I mean, th- th- he's the only guy I know that goes out on the first day and, and fills trucks up. Literally trucks. Yeah, and fortunately for us, like, if we get to hang out with him, he actually sounds like a goose. Yeah. No, he doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't sound like some of the guys in our group. Not like we did. <laughs> actually, Travis sold me my favorite call, and... Uh, he got me into the Mo Kraken from GP Calls. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm still waiting for mine, Trav. It is amazing, Travis. Welcome. How you guys doing? Thank you so much for having me on podcast. I'm looking forward to it, man. Listen, we all know how amazing you are, at Colin. But our but our listeners don't. I want you to just start this podcast off with a boom. What? Hit him with the hit him with the big hurt, man. How do you? Yeah. How do you kick off the year? I mean, how? I mean. Goose just came in. How do you do it? All right. So basically, uh, I'm going to give you guys a little rundown of what I do. I'm going to just act like I'm out in the field, see a group of geese out in the distance, call them in, call them back around, into the decoys, take them. And that will go a little bit something like this. <laughs> Kill him, boys. Kill them, boys. <laughs> that is amazing. Nice. I'll tell you what, boss. That's exactly why we love GP calls and you behind them make them epic because that was amazing. It sounded awesome. It did, didn't it? And I, t- I appreciate that, guys. I tell you what, I could absolutely use that in my ground blind all the time. So you're just going to have to move up here. That's all it has to do. <laughs> I'm going to have to get, I'm going to have, I'm going to have to that either that or clone a mini me, Travis, just to take him out with me. If he has his calling skills like that. So Travis, when people come down hunting with you, Bob, what's uh, what can they expect out of a day? Like what's, what's your day consist of taking people hunting? So it starts way before that particular day. If somebody were to come down and want to book a hunt with outdoor action, you know, to come out and shoot on some birds with us, you know, we constantly scout. We're on the river. We're in the fields. You know, I myself hunt multiple states around the Chesapeake Bay area. But if we're talking about coming down and, you know, doing a guided hunt, I always keep in touch with all the other guides and the owner, Teddy Carr, you know, scouting birds, finding out where they're roosting, where they're loafing, where they're feeding, what parts of the river they're in, what marshes they're in. You know, we'll go down to our private boat ramps, cruise around the marshes, scout, you know, 80 percent scouting, 20 percent hunting that's you know the the ratio if if you're not serious about scouting then you're not serious about hunting and don't get me wrong you know it's great being out there with your buddies you know of course a bad day of hunting beats a good day at the office but once again we don't spend all this time and effort and of course expense it is a very expensive hobby to go out there and not be successful um so that all said People come down and we'll meet up an hour before shooting time. 
mind you, I'm up at two o'clock, one o'clock in the morning every day when it comes time for the hunting wow. season to be in, you know, going out, putting out a lot of de- a decoys. You know, I, I'm a big believer in putting out my decoy rig, how it looks when the actual birds are in the area, in the field, in the ponds, in the fields, on the river banks, whatever it may be. Um, you know, not so much early season for these resident geese will I use what I like to call a Mondo rig. But once the migration shows up, I mean, I'll, I'll have up to four, five, six, seven hundred decoys out in the fields out in Delaware, you know, what? what I'm hunting with. with 700? Hunt clubs. And it's been more, dude, you know. Wow. Um, me and my good buddy, little Dave, out there in Delaware, we have these V-boards, these black and white V-boards, and he himself has 93 sets, and each set has three decoys on it. Plus, you know, we have upwards three, three around Three silos, 20- right? Oh, yeah. Three oh, silhouettes. Yeah. You know, the cons get pulled out and stuff. And, you know, great, great, you know. And, like, on a side note, for all the people out there who want to have a big rig of goose field de- decoys but don't want to pay the price it is to to have these full bodies and these shells and these silhouettes, you can make your own decoys, whether it's with that plastic cardboard, you know, you see on all of the political signs on the yeah. side of the road, you can get a lot of that stuff. You can get thin plywood, you can get masonite. You can make your own decoys and that's a great effective way to be able and you don't have to be the world's best artist. You can paint the whole goose decoy black and put the white cheek and the white tail right on there. And I mean a lot of people will say, ah, those don't look as good as my avian full bodies. But you can't tell me they don't work when I've got a group of 50 Canada's in the decoys getting shot at over black and white decoys, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and so it's all about trafficking birds and it's all about these migrators that are, you know, bouncing from refuge to feed from feed to loafing area. And you've got everybody and their brother's uncle out there hunting too. Sure. And so whoever has the most decoys out, and whoever is the loudest and has the best sound and calling is going to get the birds when yeah. you're competing against other hunters out there. They win. Yep, absolutely. It's, it's no wonder you're getting up at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning if you're putting out seven, 800 yeah. decoys. I mean, jeez. Uh, we, know, we know that, Travis, we know that you love goose hunting. And I also know that you love duck hunting. You have a duck call laying on your lap there? Oh, yeah. You know, I can definitely break out. One of these here duck calls. I'm going to use one of my favorites, actually, that GP Calls has. It's the Trickster. It's our swamp timber call, and it's our finesse call. You can really get nice and dirty with it. You know, it's got a great low end. You can do your Cajun squeals. You can do your bouncing hens and stuff. Let me uh, go ahead and break that out for you guys. Is that your favorite? That's your that's your favorite line, and I love it. Oh yeah, man! You know, you know, a lot of people like to say take them. A lot of people, you know, I have heard uh, sting them. I have heard take them. But I mean, hey guys, I mean, let's not be bashful about what we're doing out there in the blind. Yeah. We're we're shooting the kill. So I I'm never say any of those. And 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 whenever we're out hunting, it's always I thought you were going to call it. That's what I hear. <laughs> that, <laughs> That's, that's, that's what I always say. Why didn't you call it? They were close enough. As they were flying away. <laughs> you know, I always like the uh, way my dad always explained how he was going to call a shot. You know, when I was a young buck and I was uh, out there to be the dog in the days where we were hunting the fields in Haymarket, Virginia, when I wasn't old enough or big enough to shoot a gun yet and I was the dog. You know, people would always ask, him, hey, John, so when these geese come in, how do we know when it's time to shoot? My dad would always turn and look at him and say, by about my second or third shot, y'all boys raise up and stick <laughs> the gun barrels out the blind and start pulling that trigger. <laughs> yeah, my dad always yells at me, too. He's like, I thought you were going to call a shot. I'm like, the first shot was calling the shot. You know, you should start shooting. It's okay. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, you know so. it's it's definitely a good time. I mean, once you get with a good group of buddies that you know you guys always go hunting you know it's you know you and your best friends out there you know you guys all get a good feel feel for it what you want is to not have to call the shot not have to have something where somebody gets up and yells take them all right you really want to get effective on killing these birds over the decoys on the wing you want them to not know you're shooting at them all right and what i'll explain that with is you got a group of five ducks coming into the decoys. They've circled three, four times. They're starting to drop vertical. They're starting to tote pumpkins, as we like to say, down in grip pack calls. They're toting pumpkins down, baby. Wings are touching. Feet are out. Feet, you know, feet down, guns up, right? You get up. Take them, take them, take them. Now they're flaring. Now you raise the guns up. Boom, 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 boom. All right? You drop two or three. Great. Cool. Same type of scenario. You got five birds right over the the decoys. You're hunting with a good select few of your your buddies. Everybody knows when those wings start backpedaling and they're right about to touch ground or touch water, everybody raises up. Those birds don't flare. You kill all five. Well, when they're that's the way to do it. Yeah, because when they're flaring, they're they're moving way different than what you can lead a bird it's a, it's a, it's almost an optical illusion for me and how i was always always taught when they're flaring they're moving up and away it's hard to lead that you know it takes takes a little bit of time to figure that out when when you're shooting so when they're cupped up and they and you're not they're not flaring it's the best time to shoot absolutely and you know the main reasoning behind that is when they're flaring, by the time you get up to shoot, they're already 20 yards farther than what they were. They're already 10, 15, 20 yards farther. All right. If you've got a duck in the hole at 15 yards and you raise up and he's not flaring, you're shooting him at 15 yards. I don't care how fast they are going. The speed that a gun pattern has out there, it's going to be immediate. You, you put it right on the bird and he drops. Exactly. All right? No questions asked. When they're flaring and that bird was at 15 yards in the kill zone and now he's flaring away, you're shooting him at 30 yards. You're shooting him at 35 yards. You know what I mean? But absolutely, just like how you were saying, instead of them coming at your belly to your face, they're quartering away or they're rising up and they're you know gaining altitude you know absolutely you know and the way i like to say you know one thing i like to say about this is guys these birds already have enough of an advantage or you know we don't need to make it harder on us you know they already have off season where we're not allowed to shoot them they already have you know rules and regulations of this and that why make it tougher on yourself? You want it to be as easy as possible, which you can also go into people saying, well, you water swatted that duck. Well, that duck came in, liked the decoy spread, liked what he was hearing on the calls, landed in the water, and us water swatted him. Yeah. Old timers back in the day said you weren't doing it right if you didn't make those ducks touch water. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that because I had the honor of sitting in the duck blind more than once with Uncle Buck. <laughs> with my brother phil and th this group of ducks came in and i i don't know what uh, there was a bunch of mallards but there was one that one day well, we got a bunch of them ducks what was mm -hmm. that little guy that was a t that was a teal there was, no i thought it was, we had another one i don't know it was, it was an odd duck for our area but anyhow we're sitting on the pond we're sitting in the duck blind the general already cooked us breakfast a couple ducks come in general called a couple we got some ducks and he looks over and he's like phil you call this one Phil's sitting there, ducks come in, he's like, not yet, not yet, not yet, and they land on the pond, and everybody's getting ready to shoot, we're all antsy, and Phil looks over, I'm like, come on, he looks over at me and touches me in the leg, he's like, they're going to swim right on over here, Uncle Catfish, <laughs> it's like, what, they're like tw 10 yards away, he's like, let them get a little closer, <laughs> come on. Oh, it might have been a dream. I don't remember. <laughs> but the one you, I think you're confusing me with Josh Jones. It might have been Josh Jones. <laughs> but anyhow, the, the one duck that we did get that day was, like, he was the Matrix duck. There was, like, yeah. eight guns unloaded on him, and we never touched him. And he was only 20 yards away. <laughs> and he got up and, like, flew, flew off the away. pond. And yeah. he walked across the pond and shook his tail at us. And he was like, ha, ah, you guys suck. <laughs> And so I know Uncle Catfish loves it, his hunting stories, and I know he really, really wants a hunting story with 
Teddy Carr. In oh it. yeah, and so I, I like, would definitely. I like Teddy you. Carr. You know, for somebody who owns a company uh, up at the Great American Outdoor Show, I get to come visit you guys every year, um, and I hang out probably more than I should, but I enjoy telling stories and hearing them. And Teddy, for uh, you know, being one of the, the the big wigs, is like he's very approachable. He's seriously super cool dude to talk to, and he never doesn't not have time for you like he's not one of the other guys at the booze like if you're not buying calls they don't want to talk you know teddy will actually sit down and just be like what's up man let's and i you know i if if, whenever he listens this i want to let him know that that's super cool and uh uh, straight up awesome dude teddy Carr. so anyhow that was my shout out i'm in a totally different state and i can feel teddy's head getting bigger and bigger already (laughs) (laughs) so We'll edit this part out. Teddy, I want my 25 bucks in the mail uh, for what for saying that. To, you know, <laughs> what you promised me to say. <laughs> no, su- Teddy's super cool. I mean. Uh, he is a great guy, kind of fish, you know. And, you know, him and his two sons, John and Justin, they own GP Calls. Teddy himself owns Outdoor Action. And, you know, I've been hunting for 24 years. I mean, yeah, I started out. When I was a young buck, I was a dog and whatnot. I've been guiding for the last 11 years, you know. And through my guiding career, I've worked for a lot of different outfitters and guide services. And a lot of these owners, you know, it's one of those things where you'll have people who think they know everything and won't give you the time of day. And then... Oh, yeah, they're the yeah, guys. They're me. the guys I'm talking about, and you know it's yeah, you know absolutely. like you know I go in there and you know they don't know who we are, you know not that we're anybody, but you know we we know as much if not a little bit more than a normal guy that walks in a Great American Outdoor Show and you walk up to a booth and ask questions and you know try to make small talk, and there's just some guys that don't have a time of day for you, but you know from exactly. from day one, what was it four years ago I met you guys something like that, and yep. you know from day one Teddy's like, hey man, what's up? You know, so, yeah, he was very cool. Absolutely. And, you know, and, you know, working with Teddy, you know, with the call company, with the outfitter, I was, you know, just like how, how I said, a lot of these guys that I've worked with, work for, whatever you want to call it, however you want to phrase it, you know, they think they, they know everything and they won't give you the, the, the time of the day. Teddy Carr, on the other hand, he kind of does know everything and he will give you the time of day. And he's very humble about that, you know, and he's always down to exchange hunting stories, exchange conversation, you know, just like how you said, Catfish, you came up and you just hunted that morning and you were talking to us about how your call was freezing out and it didn't, you know, make the sounds that you wanted it to. It didn't have the right pitch. We got you the mo crack, and you told Teddy and myself to my face, I'm going to go hunting tomorrow morning, and I'm going to see how this works out. And what did we get the following day? We got pictures of dead birds next to you and the layout blind and some really good photography skill with your cell phone of the mo crack. Yeah, and uh, absolutely, man. And, you know, you know, I can't say uh, enough good about Teddy and his son, John and his son, Justin, you know, they're, they're great guys. You know, we've been doing this GP calls thing for a couple of years now. Yeah. We're, we haven't been around as, as long as other call companies have, you know, yes, we are learning things and, you know, doing our way, but we design our calls for two main reasons and things, whatever you want to call it. We design our calls for the hunter. You can go out, you sound like a duck, you sound like a goose, and whether you're beginner, novice, intermediate, advanced, you can pick that call up and sound like a duck and sound like a goose. Absolutely. I'm somewhere in the middle and I like you guys sold me the Mo Kraken and you know, I I would I wasn't I w- I'm not gonna say I was sold on it right away by blowing it right there to stand but that you know just using it a little bit that night the next day yeah we killed a pile of geese with it and it, it sounded amazing with just a short amount of time owning it you know i remember that day like it happened yesterday and your exact words were i don't know because because i gave you the call and i was like dude try it and 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 your exact words were oh i don't know i mean i don't want to you, you know pick up the, the call and you know i don't know and so i said dude just pick it up try it and that first hunk 
you put the call down and you looked at me and you said, holy crap. And I said, I told you it was an easy call to blow. And, you know, ever since then, like you say all the time, you know, you, you've been sold on it. And, you know, that goes out for a lot of the people out there that are listening in, you know, if you don't believe what I say and what other people say about these calls, about them being user friendly and for the hunter, then I challenge you to give it a shot and try them out. Yeah, I do too. I'll back you on that. You know, because there's calls out there that are meant for, and then this goes well along the lines of what I was saying about equipment, having confidence in your equipment, liking what you're having. You know, there's a whole lot of different calls out there with all these companies nowadays, you know, go out and try them out. But I challenge you to try these grip pack calls because I promise you, you'll pick one up, you'll honk on it if it's a goose call, you'll quack on it if it's a duck, and you'll be sold. You know, that's all it, it takes, you know, and, and the realistic sounds that, that they produce is what the hunter goes after. You know, yeah, it it's, is. It's all about hunting, you they, know what I mean? It's all about getting the birds in the decoy. They speak for themselves. I mean, out of the Great American Outdoor Show, there's a lot of guys in the call section, you know, the uh, waterfowl hall, if you will, and you guys are out of calls. Travis is literally making calls like two three, <laughs> two days before the show's over. He's making calls sitting there because you guys sell out before everybody else. Because once they I try made, them, they buy them. I totally made that mistake. It, I don't. You remember last year, Trav? I was like, I waited to like the last day. Yeah, to, we never. We normally do whenever we're we're shopping. When we're there, if we go to buy something, we wait to the end. Yeah, I mean, and you went up and. I'm like, Trav, you got that mo cracking, you got you know, get me a, a duck call and he bud, uh, you know, I I can't I got we got some more supposed to come in, but I just yeah. You can't keep they're too hot. That's my Travis impression. I don't remember me sounding like catfish when I was telling you that. <laughs> it, it was on day seven of the show. You were pretty tired. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I was a little raspy. Yeah. You're, a little, you're not that far like off percent. either. Well, if you, rem- so, if you remember, half your guys were sick by the end of the show. You're like Catfish's little brother. Even Zane didn't feel it's, it's it's Zane that was there, right? The tall young fella. Catfish light. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Even Zane didn't feel well, I don't believe. So now Travis oh, yeah. for uh What's up? for guys like myself that are This is tall this is tall Kyle, yeah, by the way. Just tall, to make sure that Kyle, you're not so. talking to DK. <laughs> for guys like oh, myself. Okay. This that, is TK. This yeah. isn't DK. Yeah. All right, cool. I gotcha. This is TK. Um, for guys like myself that are subpar when it comes to the duck calling and the goose calling, what would be the GP calls that you would recommend for somebody just trying to get into it, basically just finding their pitch and trying to work their way around the duck and a goose call? What would you recommend? For Probably that? just sticking to the camera. <laughs> 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 That's the best. Of the, uh. Well, TK, um, I'm going to tell you exactly how, how it is. Um, is it okay if I call you total killer? Because that's what I think the TK actually stands for. Sounds total glorious. Um, and it will be that after you get on these grip pack calls. So as far <laughs> as the goose call goes, I'd recommend you going with the mo cracking. You know, um, that's a call that I'll have anybody who says i do not call my other buddies call i don't sound good on a call they pick up a mo crack and i show them the hand positionings in five seconds and i tell them say who it into the call and really pronounce the it on a harsh basis and they pick up that call and they sound like a goose honk that's not and what you, you know, told me to say who it so, uh, yeah, you basically pick up the call, and the way we design the Mo Kraken, it's the uh, barrel design is helpful to a beginner caller because it already has a good amount of back pressure in there. Yeah, that you don't really need to add a lot, and um, it's one of those calls that if you're you you can never have blown a goose call before, and you pick it up, and you. Just say who it, and you get your hand positionings right, and you will sound like a goose. And uh, our advanced call- uh, callers, like Zane, you know, you remember Zane from uh, oh, yeah. the show, and you remember hearing him height. on a goose call. You guys think I'm good on the goose call. Zane mops the floor on a goose call. I mean, I'll try to sound like 
six, seven, eight, nine geese. Zane will sound like 26, 27, 28, 29 geese. It's, it's unbelievable how he is. And he loves the Mo Kraken versus the Big Hurt because he can get super fast on that Mo Kraken. It does not fight him at all. You know, a lot of people and, and Catfish will know what I'm talking about here. You can have a call that'll fight you the whole time while you're trying to honk and cluck and you know do all these moans and stuff you don't want to call that's going to fight you you want to call that that's going to help you and that's what we go after when we design this mo crack and you know you can pick it up it, if you're a intermediate caller you can sound a lot better on it and you'll be like oh my god and you know, now that confidence boost you have when you're calling at those geese, you can be somebody who's never called before. You pick that up and you sound good on it. And so that's we, what we got. Age. Some of our young hunters, Travis. I mean, you met Dalton, uh, mm -hmm. Jimmy Hunt's boy. Uh, we got in uh, some of his relatives and buddies that have come hunting with us here this past year that I let them try the Mo Kraken and, you know, Dalton came back to you and got one this year. But they all instantly became, like, better callers the day we hunted. Like, it was just, it's it's that user-friendly. Absolutely. And, you know, my apprentice, my protege, whatever you may call it, Dylan Nestor, I got to give a shout-out to, to him real quick. So he's, him and his grandfather, Mark, they come hunting with us with outdoor action all the time. And... Dylan approached me and Teddy, and he's like, you know, I really, really want to try out some of your guys' calls because, you know, I have these calls, and I don't want to name drop and bash anybody else's calls because they're all great out there on the market. I mean, let's let's be honest. They're all great, good-sounding calls. Yep. And he's like, you know, my, my duck calls just fighting me too much, you know. And so we get him on a trickster, and he just starts hail calling and come back calling. And I'm sitting there like, I can put my lanyard back in the blind bag, Dylan. You're going to call all these ducks in for us. And we end up shooting some pintails and some mallards, a couple black ducks. It was a great time. Now, the, trick, um, the trickster's not what you sold me last year. What other duck calls does, does CP have? We have the Nitty Gritty. That's the one, you, that's one, the one I got. Yep, I got yep. that one last year, yeah. Yep, and, um, and so... Me and Dylan end up, you know, working on the calls and stuff. You know, I'm teaching them. I'm, you know, giving them points and, you know, tips and pointers and stuff. And so, you know, me and Teddy start talking about Dylan participating in the junior duck and goose calling competitions for grit pack calls, you know, just like how, how I do in the senior division. Right. Cool. And, uh, you know, I, I work with Dylan on his routine and get him going. Last year, he goes up. And, and he's all nervous and stuff. And he's like, oh, I don't know about being on the stage, man. And I'm like, look, let's go out there, act like you're calling out some ducks. You know the routine. You practice it. You sound great. Does not matter. He goes up and he wins third place last year. Nice. We, we uh, work on it all off season long, all during hunting season. This year, he goes up to the Virginia State Calling Competition Junior, and he wins it. Smash. Nice. Yeah, I saw that. Boom. And so, you know, I mean, you know, yeah, me winning second place three years in a row, it's awesome, it's cool, it's not, hey man, like old Ricky Bobby said, it, it, if you're not first, you are last. <laughs> they Being call you Deuce. Dylan <laughs> there win. can't be two number ones, that'd be 11. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. And so, you know, I was just smiling from ear to ear to see Dylan go up there, as much work as that kid has put into it in his routine and how he sounds and to go up and win it. I was just, and you know, me and Teddy, we were just sitting there like, this is the future of GP calls when it comes to these competitions is Dylan. Why don't you, know? you, why don't you take his routine? His routine is exactly like my routine. Oh, uh, I'm just... oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm looking for, this was his last year and being able to compete in the junior division. And, and so I'm looking forward to, you, you know, co competing against him moving forward. You know what I mean? And so, you know, I was kind of joking with him. I was like, yeah, well, you know, I was able to get second place for three years in a row, but now it's looking like I'm going to be taking third place or maybe I'll get second place and you'll get first place. Yeah. And, and so, you know, it's definitely good, good times, but yeah, um, yeah you guys, yeah, for it, you guys yeah. are the real deal placing the way you do and it's it's not easy like and you're i don't know we were travis we were, has spent a lot of more hours than than you can imagine behind the calls building the calls using the calls to get to where he's at though i mean it's i mean i'm, I'm like a mediocre like a maybe six out of ten on a goose call 
maybe a five out of ten on a on a duck call, and that's in a room of people that don't know how to call. <laughs> so, but right. when you get when you hear Travis up at the show call, he sounds just different than the other guys in the room, and it, yeah. Yeah, and that's what brought me to his stand. I heard him calling. That's I, what took me originally to GP calls was Travis blowing that goose call in goose season, and I went over and went, I want to sound like that guy. And I feel bad because I know that like the the connection over the phone, it, you're not going to get that translation. Well, these guys just have to get on and hunt with Travis to figure it out. That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's the truth. I mean, but you're not going to get that translation that we hear it at a at the show or right. or be out in the open out in the fields with them. It's a, it's ridiculous. I've got some I know we're running kind of short on time, but I have some personal questions that I've been wanting to ask you. Um what that you could maybe help me with. There's um I have a very difficult time, which should be the easier, of bringing a pair in, Travis. What, what, what calling cadence or what should I be doing to a pair that's going from A to B that has just really got no interest in me? I, I can turn them sometimes, and other times they don't even want to look at me. So It's difficult it's when a, it's only two. Yeah, yeah. Whether it's a pair of ducks or a pair of geese, this is how you got to approach it, you know. Anybody can be out there in the field or in the marsh and blow their lungs out through a duck or a geese call. And you got to call with your eyes. You got to be able to watch these birds. The birds are going to tell you what you need to do. And so whether it's a pair of geese, let's say it's a pair of geese, all right, and and they're flying from right to left and they're about, uh, let's say, over 100 yards out, all right. I'm going to go ahead and just let them know that I'm there, okay? Give them a quick honk, you know, give them a cluck or two. If I see one of the geese's wings slow down a little bit or lock up or head turn or speed up, they're letting me know what I need to do. And so let's say I start honking at these birds, all right, and they're not even paying me any time of day. And then I start giving them a couple double clucks. Now their wings are starting to slow down. That's telling me that the double cluck is the call to use. So I'll give them another double cluck. All right. Now their wings are starting to lock up. I'm going to keep on hitting them with that same double cluck, whether it's a high double cluck or a low double cluck or somewhere in the middle. All right. I'm going to keep on that same pitch and that same tone and that same speed. That's going to keep them interested. And that's usually what you got to look for. See, a, a lot of people, they'll. So what would you first. What, what would you start with? If this, there's two geese coming by, would you honk at them first? Yeah, I would, you know, give them a, you know, and, and like, here's the other thing. You know, people who think about it aren't getting it. It's all in the gut feeling. I've always said, you know, your brain's going to lie to you. Your gut is going lies to, me to lot. lie to you. Uh, absolutely so does mine you know i'll 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 overthink things and i'll be like oh man dude you know this is what i need to do to get these birds in it doesn't work like that your gut feeling never lies to you and so whatever my gut feeling tells me at that time when i'm calling that's what i'm going to go with and so say i'm calling at them and i'm doing a couple honks and they're not their their wing beats still the same they're not looking over, you know, you can tell when, you know, ducks or geese, they, they got that head turn. You, you know what I mean? You know, you got to just call with your eyes and I'll honk at them and they're not doing anything. I'll, I'll, I'll pluck at them and they're not doing anything. I'll throw a spit note at them. All right. Which is the call I used at the end of the goose routine I did at the beginning of the show. Oh yeah. Yep. All right. And then boom, their, their head turns and I'll hit them with another spit note. Spit note, spit note, spit note. And they're starting to slow down their their wing beats, hit them with the spit note. And now they're locked up and they're turning, all right? They're telling me that that spit note is what they're keying in on. That's what they're liking to hear. I'm not going to stop that and start going to honks and clucks. My mind might tell me, all right, now change it up and start doing this. But your brain lies to you. Your gut feeling is like, dude, that spit note. Got them locked up. Keep and I on hitting that spit. And some of the guys that I've hunted with around um, like to do that. They like to throw every note out they possibly know, 
instead of, you know, doing what you're saying. So and, and here's my second question. Then. So you got him coming in. At what distance do you stop calling him? Like, or like, so I guess that goes, there's a two-part question. At what, at what point do you stop calling? Are you calling right to the point where you're going to shoot? Oh, I stop calling when I say kill him. Yeah, all right. And Absolutely. So, you know, there's so my old man, my uh, dad always told me, once you got birds turned and coming in, you got to keep them honest. You got to keep them on that line. And whether it's with geese, you know, you can do it with a honk or a cluck or a spit note. What we're just explaining, you would want to keep on doing the call that got them to turn and come in and lock up and start dropping altitude. Okay. If it's a duck, you can do it with a simple cadence. You can do it with a quack. You can do it with a soft feeding chuckle. You know, you got to now here's where, where people screw up. Boom. They hit the call, you know, birds turn and oh, 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 stop calling, stop calling. They're, they're coming in. What ducks and geese do when they're on the water, in the field, feeding, loafing, they talk. Once something alerts them, they all raise their, their, their heads up and they go quiet. So speaking fluent in duck and goose, why would you want to go quiet? That's telling them that something's wrong. Right. Well, that makes sense. I've, I've heard that many times. It's just quiet, quiet. They're too close. Shut it. You know, stop, 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 stop calling. You know, there's a bunch of different, you know, scenarios that'll go through when you're, you know, we could be sitting there and talking amongst ourselves, all right, and, you know, ha- having a good time, all right, and we look up and there's two geese just cupped up and dive bombing in and they're moaning on the way in, you know, I, I mean, everybody's seen it, you know, moaning on the way in, dropping out the two feet are poking out. We haven't even picked up the call. Why would you pick up the call? They're they're doing it. They're doing it on their own. There's times I'm hunting in the marsh, and it's January, and we've got birds that have been shot at all the way down from Canada, through New York, through Pennsylvania. Yeah, I shot at them here, too, yeah. Yep, and, uh, <laughs> you know, through Delaware and Maryland, and now they're in Virginia, and they're call shy. How does, and, it, how does it feel, by the way, to know that the only birds that you get are the ones that I missed? It feels pretty good because catfish. I I love you, but there sure is a lot of them. <laughs> we Burn. I don't know if it's this hurricane coming or what, but I've seen a lot of birds lately. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but like even like a sig a single coming in, you know, it's just like it sounds like you can apply that across the board if you're. You gotta hunt with your eyes and see how yeah. they responded. Are you ever throwing a flag to turn their heads? Like when you first see them, just kind of throwing a flag for a little bit. Are you using that at all? I'm a big believer in in the flagging. You know, it's it's one of those things where, uh, you know, when it, when you're trafficking birds or you have birds that aren't interested, you know, you you flag them and 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 you catch their attention. And and it also works when you have a group of geese 200 yards and they're going from left to right, and you hit them with the flag. All right, and I like having more than just one flag going. I'll have, you know, one on the left side of the layout blinds and one on the right side or the pit or the A-frame or the box blind, whatever, all right? And you'll hit them with the flags and they turn, all right? Now you're calling at them and everything, and they're looking pretty hard. They're kind of starting to set up and everything, and then they circle back around, and now they're going out. You'll hit them with the flag again. That'll turn them back. What you don't want to do is flagging and not stopping flag. You 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 want to use the flag to catch their attention, and you know I, I've seen it where where people will flag and not stop and keep on flagging and then wonder why the birds didn't finish. So you once, I mean? once you get their attention, just stop. Oh yeah, absolutely. Them good old boys down in Arkansas hunting that flooded green timber. They believe in flagging for ducks, and uh, I've I've actually seen it where. They'll flag at these birds, and then they'll swat the water with it, and they'll flag on the way down and swat the water. And they'll and pick it's up all mud, that, too. Kick up, it'll kick up. pick up mud. It'll yep. move ripples throughout the decoys. The the ducks hear the, the uh, water swatting going on, whatever you may call it. You can definitely flag ducks in. You can flag in geese, absolutely. Um, what it's supposed to symbolize when you're out there goose hunting 
is two things. It's supposed to symbolize geese sitting there and they're feeding and they're taking a you know a break from eating corn or eating barley or whatever, eating soybeans, and they stretch their their wings out. It also symbolizes geese coming in and landing. Basically, what you're doing when the geese are circling and they're leaving out and you're hitting them with the combat call and you're flagging is that lead bird or one of the more dominant birds in that group of 20 thinks a couple of their birds broke off and, and landed. And so that's going to turn them immediately to want to come in and join the rest of the you know family and stuff and join the rest of the flock. Sure. And so once again, stop thinking about it. Your gut is never going to lie to you. You know, that's one thing, you know, one of my main tools I use when I'm out there hunting these geese and ducks is my gut feeling, you know, whether it's with decoy placement, whether it's when I should call a shot, because I don't know if these mallards are going to come back around and finish right. Maybe we should take them on one of the turns, you know, calling all that stuff. Well, I got six or eight guys that I hunt with, and that's the problem. We all have a different gut instinct. So two guys are mm-hmm. flagging. One guy's saying, don't Go flag. Go with my gut. Yeah. One guy's <laughs> shooting early. The other guys don't even have his gun loaded. And the, other, the other guy's walking to the truck because he's cold. And some guy's throwing a cheeseburger at somebody because he don't have pickles on it. Like, the geese don't really come in for us a lot because there's other things going on. There's always somebody out kicking the decoys because they're they don't work right. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, 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 but that's that's the great part about goose hunting to me is it's not actually killing geese. <laughs> there is, comes Will out pheasant hunting. Yeah. It is the com- the camaraderie and the <laughs> Ryan's craziness. throwing a whopper plopper through the decoys. Yeah. <laughs> I thought we were fishing today. <laughs> it's uh. Bless our hearts. And you know the worse weather the better for me. I find that I have less hunting pressure when it's cold out. So we like to hunt February. And, uh, absolutely, absolutely, and you know, I really appreciate you know you uh, in, inviting us out there to be able to hunt with you guys. We are definitely going to take you up on that offer, and, and and you know maybe bring the cameras up and do a little filming and stuff. It's it's, it's definitely going to be a good thing. Now, before we we go on to any more um, parts of the conversation, I do want to tell Kyle real quick because he asked a question and I only answered it half. Um, T- now, go is that on. TK? Okay. What, is DK. that DK or TK? Or Mitch Kyle. That's definitely not DK. <laughs> he's, he's definitely going to have to buy me a beer. He's, he's gonna, out. Uh, before we uh, get on talking terms again. What if I um, just I'm buy, sure a, he's a buy a duck guy. call come from you? you know, just, uh, there you go. I ordered, order one good. of each. Just step in the right there direction. There you go. That's you know, definitely a good start. Um, so, Kyle. Yes. Um, now, as far as your your goose call go, we already spoke about the mo crack and yep. how it's you know you can get real fast on it. It's it's easy for beginners to pick up and sound like a goose. That's great. That's great. That that's awesome. Now your duck call. All right, we offer three different types of duck calls. We have our trickster, which is the one I used for you guys that you you know we had on the show earlier. All right, that's our swamp timber call. You can get real nasty with it. You can get on the finesse calls. It's great. It's got awesome Cajun squeal. All that's good. We've got the nitty-gritty NG1 single read and NG2 double read. All right, a lot of people, you know, were asking about us making double reads and stuff. And so when we designed the nitty-gritty, me and Justin, more so Justin than me, I was just kind of like the guinea pig. You know, he might say different, but me and Justin did design this nitty gritty. All right. And we have a double read for that. You know, it's a workhorse of a call. You can get on the Cajun squeals. You can go finesse on it. You can get nice and loud with it. All that's good. Well, the one I want to talk to you about is the originator, the true grit. All right. And we revamped the true grit. We had a certain style insert for it. We asked ourselves, can we do better? And we did. We redesigned a new insert for it. It was actually up there at the show when you guys were here. I think we were sold out of them by the time you guys came by. We we were sold out of true grits, and we were almost sold out of nitty-gritties. Anyways, the true grit is as raspy as it gets. It's got a very easy, great pronouncing feeding chuckle on it. And the reason why this would be good for you, somebody who's new to calling, yep. is because a call that won't fight you as much. When you pick up a duck call, some people can pick up a duck call and sound like a duck on it and be like, what am I doing right? Some people can pick up a duck call and not sound right on it and say, what am I doing wrong? The raspier the call, the easier it is for somebody to pick it up that's new to calling and sound like a duck. 
Makes you sense. Know, a, a, a feeding chuckle that's easy and rolls rolls off the tongue. That's something that you can pick up and just immediately start doing. You know, whether it's your realistic sounding feeding chuckles or it's your machine gun style feeding chuckles. You know, it's 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 definitely one of those things where. I just wanted to finish that up. I didn't want to leave you hanging. No, and, yeah, uh, definitely appreciate it. Tra- Travis, what Absolutely, you, check it out. What Go do ahead. you mean by the call fighting you? So how easy it is to use the call and produce the sounds that you're going after, you know, whether it's a goose call that has a real thick reed and it, you need to add a lot of back pressure with your hand positionings and it's just really hard to crack over you know from doing that nasally murmur to the actual cluck and a honk all right it it's fighting you a lot and for a duck call you know if you try to do a feeding chuckle into it it's kind of acting a little stiff on you and it's not really rolling through you know it's it's fighting you all right and so once again when we design our calls and and we tune them up we tune them up so they don't fight you as much you know the 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 last thing you want to for example for a new caller the last thing you want is you're already nervous about calling at ducks because you're like oh man i'm a new caller you know i mean jesus when travis does it you know he just sounds like a bunch of ducks and this and that and i don't know i don't know i don't know how i feel about it when you have a call that's fighting you a lot you're gonna feel worse about it all right the last thing you want is for you to pick up a call and call at those birds and then flare whether it's because you didn't do it at the right time or you didn't sound right or it was fighting you when you have a call that doesn't fight you but helps you enhances you that's what i'm getting at and steven you know, whether travis is travis i'm gonna on travis's point if you pick up a call and you just blow through it like just with your mouth pressure you're like just yeah. it's not gonna sound anything like what you want it to you gotta blow from your gut you know, you got to blow from your diaphragm uh, to make it sound you, like the. Remember the gwit that he was talking about? Yeah. Gwit. Yeah. Gwit. Well, he. There's certain sounds that you have to make to make the goose call make a certain sound, and it can fight with you if you just don't have the little techniques no right. Air. More yeah. so, so if I'm a new, it can make the wrong call. sound. I guess that's I'm trying to help, tell Steve Travis help Steve understand. It can make the wrong sound, even though you're trying to do it right. Yeah, you're supposed to say who exactly. cooks for you, who cooks for you all. Yep, that's well, that's the who I'll call. That's right. So so if I'm a new, <laughs> it's the who duck. <laughs> Yeah, he's trying to locate some birds, some turkeys. So if I'm if yeah. I'm a new caller. You, which you are. Which, which you are. I don't. I'm not. I'm, I think new caller would probably be uh, like a can you, complimentary statement of me. So if can if you I'm hear someone, me now? Yeah. <laughs> how do you know me? when you've got it right? First, that's kind when, of a, when Travis tells you that's good. The, yeah. <laughs> or he says, I'm gonna Stop put away. Call. I'm going to put away my lanyard and let you call Stevie. But, I'll tell you well, now. I don't live close to Travis. Right. Yeah, so how, how do I know? How if I'm you gonna... know when you got it right is is you pick up that call and say you've got a duck call and you've got a group of nine mallets flipping around and you make a noise out of that call and those ducks turn in and light up right in the kill zone and you raise up and you pull that trigger three times. That's how you know. And this goes into something deeper. (laughs) This goes so deep. All right. This goes deep. I'm talking way in there. All right. I've hunted with lots of different hunters. All right. I've hunted with guys who have won championships. I've hunted with guys who you're sitting there looking at a man. You're like, his goose call seriously sounds like a bicycle, like a bike. horn. Uh, There's nowhere even close. Like a clown car. Exactly, like a clown nose, whatever you want to call it. All right. Uh, uh, now, uh, uh. I've heard pe- people sound amazing on calls and flare birds. I've heard people on calls that you're like, is this guy serious right now? And it does not take somebody that sounds amazing on a call to call in birds. What it takes is somebody who calls with his eyes, watches these birds, listens to his gut. And his gut feeling says, 
blow into that call right now and you blow into that call and the ducks hear it, the, the geese hear it. And it was right at the perfect timing. Calling has a lot to do with timing, timing, gut feelings and making noise, baby. That's what it comes down to. And I want to add and, to that and, it, and staying in your blind. <laughs> Stand I have got. I have a lot. Of, I have some really good friends that like to get out and walk around in the corn stubble because there's no geese around, and then they all run to the blind after the geese are already over top of us, and they're like, "I don't know. I, we flagged them and everything. I don't know why they didn't come in." Well, I'll tell you why they didn't come in, because they were. You were standing looking at them outside your blind. You need this new the, friends, bud. This goose thing yeah. is pretty hard. <laughs> You know, they, uh, so they anyhow, are. Travis is absolutely correct. Sitting still and staying in your blinds, a, a good, another good tip. So, so it sounds like there's really no substitute. The only way to get better is to get out and find birds and well, that's any how you get them up. up. I mean, yeah. it's you, you can know. read books on fishing and hunting deer and elk and you know geese ducks Experience. until you get out and do it and fail and fail yeah. until you win. You'll never get good it's at it. Like, and, you know, that's a good, good, good point that Catfish just made right there. Because back when I was younger, you know, when I was a young buck, my dad always, you know, I learned everything from my dad when it comes to this. Yeah, I've learned things from your Teddy Cars and the other people who I've worked with and worked for and people who I've hunted with. I've even learned stuff from, you know, cat, I, you know Catfish. You know, I mean, hey. Now I feel special. I, I never want to. The me feel special, day okay. I say I know everything and I don't want to learn anything else is the day I'm going to stop hunting. Yeah, the day right. you quit, right? So my dad gave me a Yetson double reed and a old single reed duck call. And a sure a shot, flute. right? Yep. All right. He said, you're going to learn how to call the, uh, these birds in. And I was like six or seven. I was a young kid. Or you're grounded. Um, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I was like, well, I could do homework or I could honk on this goose call. Great. I'm going to honk on this goose call. And so um, <laughs> when we were in the blind and, you know, it's my dad and his hunting buddies and he's telling all of his hunting buddies, Travis is calling in the birds. A lot of pressure. And they would hoot and holler and I would call at birds and they would flare. I was a kid. I didn't know what I was doing. But exactly how catfish says it's that experience it's it's that failing that will get you to where you need to be i would rather and fail so, as a kid than a than a 40 year old i was thinking <laughs> the same thing yeah <laughs> just saying yeah and it's true but it is like anything i mean it's true look, look, look what happened to phil this year get back into fishing hardcore what did we learn by failure don't use four pound. Don't, don't use four, four pound, pound test line, <laughs> or you would have had a monster. Unless you're ice fishing. Don't, but next yeah. summer you won't have that on there, and you'll no. catch him. Don't use a five year old deep cycle battery. Yeah. <laughs> speaking of, <laughs> hold speak, on, this is the part of the podcast where we stop and just. Speaking of, <laughs> pick on Phil. Yeah, these, these are all very specific examples. <laughs> <laughs> these are lessons. I'm glad we went into the pick on because I actually had a decent question here, Travis. First time caller, long time listener, <laughs> long time listener. <laughs> Phil Buckman here, <laughs> Uncle Buck. Thank for you. Nice of you to join us tonight, Phil. Um, Long time later. First of all, why don't single read, <laughs> double read? Please tell me why you, there is a single. Why is there a double? If there is anybody there you, you at for, this what do you table, get? if there's anybody at this table that loves duck hunting, oh. I think out of all of us, I think Phil actually has his tail feathers ruffled the most. Yeah. So and this he's is been a, all ears tonight. It's yeah, he's been, been all ears. So now he's just this, absorbing everything. Well, I'm I'm learning a ton. Like the the whole. Oh, you can pick thing. Travis's brain well, about duck hunting. When sure. Travis, like, and, and I, I, I'll get back to my question. I'll ask it again. But I thought about this earlier too, when Travis was talking about um, hunting and calling with using your gut, using your eyes. I couldn't help but recall back to Larry Dahlberg. And being more organic with your fishing is exactly what Travis was saying. You can't have a set cadence. You can't have a set, you know, maybe at, at a calling contest, that's great. But in the field, you've got to be, it, it, it's, a, it's a living moment. And, it's, and things are changing by the half second, if, you know. And 
calling like it totally makes sense to me. I, I I've hung on to every word of that, and but I need to ask a simple question again. What what it, single read double read? Explain that a little bit for the first time caller. First of all, starting off, excellent question, Uncle Buck. Now, you know, the thing about a single read and a double read, we started out only making single reads. And a lot of people will say the same thing. Single read sounds more realistic than a double read. All right. Now, let's get down to the bare bones of it. You know, you have the insides of a duck call. You know, you have the insert which is the part of the duck call that you put your hand on you have the barrel which is the part of the duck call that you blow through inside of that you have a tone board all right which the reed the reed lays on and then you've got your wedge that holds the reed in place with the tone board and then you've got a funnel that the air pushes through and makes the reed vibrate and thus making it sound like a duck. It makes noise. All right. A double reed is as obvious as it sounds. It's two reeds laying on top of each other. All right. Now a double reed duck call, it's apparently and supposedly supposed to be easier to blow. It's supposed to be able to have somebody pick up and sound more quote unquote ducky. All right. Now I've always been a big believer and not even worrying about using a double read. There's no reason for anybody, in my point of view, a lot of people will say different, in picking up a double read and learning how to blow on a double read versus starting off on a single read. Now, we go into the grip pack way of doing things. We design our calls for the beginner, the first-time callers, to pick up and sound like a duck. It doesn't fight you. Sounds realistic. It's real raspy, whatever it may be. All right. Now, people say you don't need to grunt as much into a double read. Bitch, do a single read. All right. And that'll help out people trying to learn how to call. Just throwing it out there. I don't grunt into a duck call at all. I always use a precise airflow that works that read to have a ducky sound you know now learning just like how catfish said you got to really bring it from the gut you got to bring the air from the belly to make that precise airflow and it helps when people grunt all right now you're double unless, unless, unless you sound like me and then you, it comes natural exactly <laughs> yeah. it, exactly so uh, may, uh, maybe you need to start screaming and yelling a lot so your voice gets all hoarse and you can just sound like Uncle Catfish. Well, that's and then what I do all golden. day. I do all day at work. I just scream and yell at my patients. So, <laughs> hold still, I said. <laughs> I ain't done yet. Get back here. No, but it's it, he's right. The, being able to control your diaphragm like a singer is important. Go ahead, Trevor. Uh, yeah, so basically what you need to do is you need to go to where Catfish works. You need to, you know, grab one of his patients, do his vitals, tell him your vitals are 180 over 120. You need to stop drinking all this coffee and energy drinks, and you need to just calm down. Have you ever seen the movie where Will Smith goes woo and rubs his ears? Do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but um yeah you know we designed our nitty-gritty to have a ng1 single read and an ng2 double read and you know double reads are great it's once again whatever you feel comfortable on all right you could be a great duck caller but just like a double read more and so why would you want to switch to a single read? This goes into what we were talking about with confidence. You know, it, if you're not confident in your duck call and the way it sounds to you, then you're not going to be as successful when you're calling. When you see a group of birds and you pick up that, that call and you call at them, it's just not really going to be 100% there. It's not going to be 110%. If you're not first, you're last. So that's what it comes down to now. I do agree with what people say on the stereotype of single reach sounding more "quote unquote" ducky than double reach. Well, this is great stuff, yeah. bud. I, I'm guilty 100 percent of letting all my my buddies call. You know, I got some good callers that I hunt with. And, Thanks, bud. And I'm, you know, 
I'm happy with the amount of duck meat in my freezer. Don't get me wrong. You know, so why would I call? But you know, working a little bit more closely with you and uh, – I'm going to step it up this year. There's no question about it. I definitely have more confidence now to at least step up and try Try a nitty-gritty one or a nitty-gritty an NG2. I'm looking forward to February coming up so I can sit there at the booth and hang out with Travis and try these things out and not oh, we're like you're going to be trying them before February. Hey, have, have Oh, absolutely, month. you know. We're uh, definitely going to have you guys down. I was just talking to John, one of the owners of the call company. You know, he had a great idea, you know. I was telling him, "Look, you know, we're going to do this show on on early goose hunting or goose hunting even though we've been talking a lot about duck hunting too. Um, we're going to do a show on duck hunting at the end of October, beginning of of November." And then I was like, "John, but they also want to come down here and do a hunt and then do a podcast afterwards. And John goes, I've got a better idea. How about they come down here, me and you take them hunting, and we do a podcast during the hunt. Dude. Holy buckets. Don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to threaten you like how Catfish threatens his patients at the hospital. You know? And, and, you know, just just picture it, guys. All right. Would you We're wanna... sitting in there. We've got the mojo spinning. We've got the pulsator butts bubbling. All right. We've got the coffee pouring. Uncle Catfish is downing himself with some corn dogs and some gummy worms. All right. Yeah. And we're all talking about, hey, Travis, what's the decoy rig like? What's this going? Ooh, 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 ooh. Get down, get down, get down. Kill him, boy. Kill him. Shut boom, up. Boom, 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 boom. So we did. All right. You know, and then, you know, I can snicker and I can laugh about how me and John are on the left side of the blinds and there's five dead ducks on our side and there's one crippled <laughs> duck on your guy's side. Exactly. We can do that. Yes. And then I'll look at Catfish and I'll say, well, Catfish, you're not in Pennsylvania, you're in Virginia, and it looks like them boys down in Carolina have a couple more birds they're going to be shooting at this coming week. <laughs> tell, me, tell me about your Mossberg again. <laughs> <laughs> Tra- Travis, you used a couple terms uh, 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 several times throughout the podcast here that I was hoping to maybe get the the ten cent definition on for some folks that might not know what they mean. So if you don't mind, there's there's three of them here that I wanted to ask you about. Absolutely. You just so w- when you say turn the duck or the goose, w- w- what does that mean? What what does it mean to turn them? So. What will happen is you see ducks flying, or geese will use ducks right now in this scenario. You see ducks flying, and they're not coming in. They're either going away, or they're going left to right, or right to, to left, or whatever direction they are flying. They're not coming to you, locking up their wings, landing in your decoys. What a turn is, is when you get the duck's attention, and they turn literally towards you towards your hunting blinds towards your decoys all right now also what will happen is when ducks come in to land sometimes they'll drop straight down vertically down into your rig and you call the shot and you shoot and you pull the trigger three times all right and hopefully something falls more times than not a group of ducks will come towards you and circle around, whether it's clockwise or sometimes counterclockwise. They circle around. They scope out everything, make sure it's safe, especially for a group of geese and a group of ducks. There's a lead goose and a lead duck. Usually for ducks, it's the hens because the drakes are following their girlfriends. But for geese, it's the lead bird. It's the dominant bird out of that group of geese that's there to protect his flock. And he'll circle around because he wants to make sure his flock is safe coming in for a landing. So what happens when they circle around you is you'll call at them as they're going away, and they'll circle back around. They'll turn back around, and you can talk them into landing you know that's what a turn is talk them into cupping toting pumpkins baby feet down guns up that's the way to do it so the the other the others was cupping and flaring what what is a what is a cupping so cupping up is uh basically when a duck's flying his wings are flapping up and down right right great 
when he cups up, his wings arch and lock up and stop moving. And that's basically what a duck or a goose does to okay. slow down. A, a duck isn't going to fly 45 miles an hour and slam into the ground or into the water. You know, they have to cup up and spread their wings out and, you know, kind of slow down to come in and land safe, uh, safely. Kind of like how on an airplane, when an airplane's getting ready to land, all of its extra wing panels open up and extend out. The flaps So it down. can slow down. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, ducks will do that with their wings, and they'll also open up their tails, and they'll kind of just parachute. It's kind of like when a parachute opens up. You know, they they flow down to come in for a landing. Now, mind you, there are some diver ducks that don't really do that because they don't have the, you know, big wing set like how puddle ducks do. They don't have big tail a tail feathers like how puddle ducks do. And I've seen diver ducks just kind of just slam into the water because they're a diver duck, and that's how they land. <laughs> I'm a diver. But, yeah, yeah. I'm a bluebill. I'm a redhead. You know, and so that's what happens now. Oh, a slam. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, flaring, when ducks and geese flare, it'll leave a sour taste in your mouth. It'll really, really get you feeling down and out for the count. Because what happens when a duck flares is he's coming in, he's looking good, he he turns, he cups up, and then he doesn't see something that he doesn't like, mainly because they're going into catfish in his buddy's rigs, and they see somebody out walking <laughs> amongst the corn stalks, kicking over decoys. They see catfish and, and hear his raspy voice, get down, there's birds coming in, you idiot. Oh, my God, I'm, I could pummel you right now. <laughs> they see, you know, Ky like, Kyle over there looking at his juice like coffee there. and like, I don't think I should call it these birds or not. And, and they see Uncle Buck sitting there being like, Hey guys, they'll get closer. First time caller, <laughs> lifelong hunter. <laughs> you, you just told me when to kill them, and I'll point that gun barrel outside the blind and pull the trigger three times. All right. And so basically, and what happens does. when a duck flares or a goose flares is they'll start flapping their wings as fast as possible and gain altitude and do very agile moves to get away. Ducks getting in that close when when they hear a human being that they didn't know was there scream out, take them, boys. They immediately start to flare and try to get away. Yeah. All right. And so, you know, it's it, and, and it'll play tricks with you because especially with geese and like this goes in. It's like, you know, people ask me, well, well, how far do I need to lead these geese? You know, geese don't look like they're moving fast, but they really are moving fast. You know, a lot of people say, well, Travis, how far away were those geese when we did a pass shoot on them? You know, and, and a pass shooting is something where they're not decoying and they're just flying by and you pass shoot them. You shoot them on the pass. There's shots where they're decoying in and they're kind of hovering. You'll see ducks or geese cupped up and kind of just floating on down into your rig. And then when they flare, they're going twice, three times, four times as fast as what they were. And it plays tricks on your eyes and, and, and you miss and you shoot behind them because you were thinking that, that they were just easing into the decoys and now they're speeding up and they're going. Yeah. And so they, they definitely, at you that, know, at that point, I normally aim half the body of the goose in front of them. That's not, I mean, that's, that's what I do with my gun. And and, I mean, that, and that, that's like when they're already in close to the decoy set and you're right, they are moving fairly fast. And like he's saying, the evade, the, the flare, I mean, once they turn and fly away and you're shooting at the back end of them instead of the front end of them, you know, especially in late February, it's, it's tough with a steel shot to put them down anyhow. So Absolutely. And, you know, talking about what we are right now, I'll I'll tell you guys a couple things I do when it comes to shooting at these birds. All right. So the main thing is, you know, I like to use 
the, the pointing finger method. All right. I'll hold. So I'm a righty. So I'll have the uh, right hand on the trigger. Right. And I'll have the gun stock up in my right armpit and I'll hold the, the uh, stock of the gun with whether it's a pump where you would pump the gun with, you know, just below the, the barrel for, for new time listeners or people new to the sport. I'll hold that part of the gun and my pointing finger will be out parallel with the barrel pointing at what I'm aiming at. And so basically if you're sitting there and I'm sure uncle Ben or uncle Buck, see, yeah. You're calling me a Tyler and you can call, 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 call me Uncle Ben. I'll be in the rice paddies oh, with yeah. you. Shooting Uncle duck. Ben. Yeah, man. Absolutely. And <laughs> so Uncle, Uncle Ben Ben right now could San not Francisco make treat. eye contact with catfish. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I definitely missed something there. I'll tell you. Uncle Ben's right now. rice <laughs> Yep, a- absolutely, absolutely. And so, basically, with the pointing method, which is what I'm getting at, is Uncle Buck can sit there and not look at catfish, but with his peripheral vision, point at his face. Do it right now, Uncle Buck. All right. So don't look at cat. Just look over at the corner that we had Mitch sitting in because he's in timeout. All right. Yeah. But look at point- Mitch. But point with your pointing finger at Catfish's face. All right, with your peripheral vision. Now, look down along your arm and what your finger is pointing at and see. Is is it directly on Cat Catfish's face? No, it's completely off of him. Okay. Wrong guy to use for that scenario. <laughs> um, that scenario. All right. Now But I, anyways, I, I, I but Travis, I'm I'm gonna back you up on this. I, I'm totally I was totally getting what you were saying because you you look at what you point at. Exactly. It, it, you look exactly. at exactly where you point or where you look, you will point at where you point you'll look at. And and so what I'm getting at here is people who try to look down the gun barrel and you know at the bead at the end of their gun and 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 look at that and look at the bird. No. Like Pete like you can do it, but here's what I like to do. I like to have my pointing finger out. Because what I point at, I'm on. Amen. Dead on. And so, basically, when I raise up on a bird, I'm pointing at it, all right? And, and, and as it's flying, I'm still pointing at it. So, I already know that I'm on that bird. Now, this is the second part of what I feel is crucial. And, you know, I show this method to clients that are doing guided hunts with the outfitter, outdoor action. I, I, I do this with kids on a youth hunt. It's the four Bs of shooting. All right. Say you have a duck going from left to right. All right. The first B, you start behind the bird, the bird. You swing through the butt, past the bill, then you boom. The four Bs of shooting, bird, butt, bill, boom. All right. And what that does is it accelerates your swing, your follow through, and you get enough lead where Catfish was saying, I'll aim about a goose and a half length in front of the bird. If you swing through the shot, start from behind the bird, and you catch up, you're going to swing as fast as they're flying. And as soon as you get past the bill, you're going to shoot, and you're going to follow through, and it's going to be the amount of lead you need to kill that bird. Makes sense. Dude, I, I've i never heard it like that, and I can't even tell you how much sense that makes. And for to go through that, it, I mean, I don't shoot every bird I shoot at, you know, but I, I do have success. And, but I just, I've never had a, a something to kind of like guide me, you know, those, so... I do appreciate that. That that's unexpected for me to learn that tonight. Yeah, that was very absolutely, good. absolutely. You know, and it's a lot of those things where, you know, a lot of people they'll. And don't get me wrong, it it, it dude, your adrenaline spikes through the roof when you have a group <laughs> yeah, of thirty true. pintails drop dropping right into the decoys, and you're not going to pick the gun up every time and be like, "Am I pointing? And am I starting at 
the bird's butt. And what did he say about a butt? I don't know what he was saying. But, dude, I'm telling you. He's always talking start about behind butt. the bird. What? Well, you the see butt. those long sprig tails on a pintail, and your mind just goes crazy anyways. Yeah. That's... Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we are we are bumping up on time, Trav. I, I can't even tell you. It's been uber informational and super fun. The guys are, you know, we're all kind of like, how, how have we hunted over the last couple of years without you? We got to do a part <laughs> two. <laughs> it's just, a, I mean, we could do this for hours. So I'm excited uh, to get my hands on a GP call. That's, that's now my number one mission. I don't think so. Travis is going to sell you one, honestly. <laughs> I'm still in time. Wait, now. who's this talking? <laughs> that, that's Mitch. Oh, okay. this Mitch. Is Mitch. Oh, great. All right. How you doing, bud? Doing good? <laughs> hey, I'm ready to buy a call. I thought we were on good speaking terms then. We are. All okay. right. Think uh, of how it'll be if you buy two calls. <laughs> <laughs> Life will be better. And a guided hunt. Yeah. Oh, man. You might be my best friend after this conversation. There you go. <laughs> what I really like is if you go up, uh, you know, and obviously you guys can go on, on their website and uh, and buy these calls. But if you go to the the, the Great American Outdoor Show, you, you can actually see Travis and meet Zane. And you, you guys can go right to their booth. It's in the Waterfowl Hall. And get your hands on these calls and try them before you buy them. And, uh, I mean, you're going to buy them. They're, they're awesome. But, Travis, if you ask him, listen, man, what am I doing wrong with this double honk? What am I doing wrong here? Um, why can't I get this thing to, 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 to moan properly? And he'll show you. He'll take his time to show you. So you guys get down there this year, this February. You're going to be there again this year, right, Travis? Oh, yeah. All show long. You know it, brother man. And don't go on the last day because the Mokraken probably will be sold out. It don't matter how many they bring. They always sell out. Um, and uh, so do yourself a favor. There's going to be, like, spoiler alert, there's going to be a new call out this year. It's all black and silver. Has my name on it. It's the Uncle Catfish. You're going to get your hands on one of those. <laughs> it's, it's a really raspy goose call. And, uh, it's a triple read, actually, so it'd be all good. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, One for the dorsal fin. It's got yes, dors- absolutely. I know I'm going to walk out with uh, one of those NG1s or 2s, depending on which one I can make sound like a nitty gritties by the yeah. nitty gritties. I love mine. Yeah, it's good time. And and here's another thing about um GP calls, if you will, Travis, is I'm really, really extremely tough on my equipment. No matter what I own, from backpacks to, to archery equipment to kayaks. My, my kayaks, my rifles. <laughs> um last year I actually accidentally now it was an accident that I actually I believe I ran over it in the snow my mo cracking and i knocked the reed out of it and i called up gp texted travis it was fixed in a day like they they sent me stuff out that same day to get me stuff um is that because it's catfish i mean i i don't know is or is that kind of normal i'm sure they'll fix it if you if you screw it up well what happens when you buy one of our calls is you yourself become a part of the grit pack and you know It's one of those things where you're lifelong, dude. Like, you're a part of the grip pack. You're a part of the family. And we take care of family, all right? And, you know, yes, we do have that lifetime warranty. You know, even if it's for a simple retune, you know, say, you know, you have your call tuned up exactly like how Zane tuned it for you and and you love it. And then it just one day, it just kind of gets a little out of tune you send it back we'll get zane down you know down there to tune it up with your call in particular cat catfish Mm -hmm. when you texted me i drove from northern maryland down to southern virginia central central virginia that night when teddy called me and he said he had your call and i tuned it up exactly like how to the best of my abilities mind you it was three years later to how it was and I remembered exactly what it was you were looking for in a call and sent it back to you the very next morning in the mail, overnight shipping. Yeah, right. it, it was a, it was amazing customer service. Wow. It really was. Absolutely. Well, you know. I'm we happy to be part of the great pack. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, that's you know, 100% accurate. Like, I, I, you know, Catfish and I, we debrief from the outdoor show, all these shows we go to. Yeah. And, you know, he just... I could go to any call maker in that room 
you know, and, and talk and, and, and buy their calls. But it's a lot like at R2 when we, like Travis is on the phone. He's part of our brotherhood. He's part of our family now. People that are become our friends are on the show. When a company like GP and Travis and they say, hey, when you buy a call from us, you're part of our grit pack now. That means a lot. Yeah. It's you, I better mean, than any kind of warranty you can give me. Yeah. Yeah. He did, like, you go out of your way to, to see them, you know, to go there, to see them, to talk to them. And, uh, and coincidentally, you know, the last couple of years now, I'm part of, you know, I haven't used the Absolutely. calls out in the field, but I mean, I can walk up to Travis and give him a tickle if I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I like tickling well, Travis, actually. Tickle fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happens is, you know, we make these calls and we design these calls and, you know, we believe in our product and we stand behind our product because we do have a quality product. What it comes down to is like we were just saying, you know, once you buy one of our calls, you are a part of the grip pack. And we're not going to leave anybody behind when it comes to, you know, oh, man, I lost my reed out of my goose collar, the reed split or whatever it may be. It can go on to being like, dude, man, I can sound good on a goose call. I can honk on it. I can cluck on it. But I can't do that spit note that you're talking about. Catfish knows. I mean, this past year while we were talking and, you know, having a good time at the show. I was retuning somebody's call and showing them how to do the more advanced calling on there. There is nothing that we won't do when it comes to customer service. We had one of our members of the Grip Pack buy a call, and his nickname is Bomber. And he has an engraving that he likes to have. It's the shape of a bomb, and it's dropping down like, you know, he, uh, he was big into the military. He wanted to have that engraving on his call. So we had him send over the PDF file. We sent it up to our engraver, said, look, put this on the call right below the GP call engraving on the insert. Got it back. He absolutely loved it. I mean, there's nothing we won't do. You know, yeah, we offer our calls in traditional colors, smoke, black, ivory. If you, you know, translucent blue, if somebody wants a smoke barrel with a translucent blue insert on their goose call, We'll do it for you. Yeah, you know we got a lot of talking to do here, Trav. Black and so, orange, baby. That's awesome. And to go out of your way for everybody like that, and especially the military and things that you know, we love to cater to them. Listen, brother, I can't thank you enough. All these guys around the table are saying, "Will, thanks for calling, Travis. He's amazing." Don't you. don't think, Trav, for a second, though, that we're not going to have you back on at the end of season to tell us some of your hunting stories. Yeah, and we got to talk about, I mean, I, we t this is mainly the goose co you know, conversation. Let's talk about some ducks later. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, man. Absolutely. I'm sure we'll have some stories to share back and forth, you know, come a month from now. I mean, goose season is in here right now This for us. And uh, there's lots of geese in the area, so hopefully, hopefully Saturday afternoon, maybe we'll have some pictures for you. Awesome. Trav, how can they find you? So you can find us on Instagram at GP Calls, GP underscore Calls. You can find us on Facebook at Grit Pack Calls, G-R-I-T-P-A-C-K Calls. And then you can also find us on the internet, GPCalls.com. And yeah, man, I really appreciate you guys and everything you do for us and with us. And I'm looking forward to what the future brings, brothers. All right. Thank Amen. you, man. Yeah. Thanks, thank bud. You. Right. Thanks for listening to the Rut and River Pursuits podcast. Follow the R2 Pro staff by searching Rut and River Pursuits on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Until the next episode, we need to see you in the outdoors.